Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Phillies Talk podcast presented by Team Toyota. Corey Seidman joined by Jim Salisbury. As we sit down here on a Wednesday, three days into Phillies full squad workouts. And Jim, uh, you know, everybody's pretty much shown up at this point. Bryce Harper showing up Tuesday. Uh, some news about Reese Hoskins earlier in the week. Also some guys who were looking a little different. So let's go through all these guys one, on, one, uh, one by one. Let's start with Reese Hoskins. Uh, what's the latest on him and his uh, readiness slash uh, availability for uh, early April? Yeah, I asked Reese Hoskins point blank uh, a couple days ago, uh, are you going to be ready for opening day? And he says, you know, that's the goal, that's the hope. Uh, and he believes there's a good chance. He has been cleared medically to do everything on the field. As we know, he had that elbow surgery. Uh, I think it was in October. Uh, it was not Tommy John surgery uh, where they, you know, would reconstruct the UCL uh, ligament. It was a repair of the UCL ligament. Uh, so it was the less um, extensive procedure. Uh, he's doing everything on the field. Said he, cle- he was, quote, unquote, cleared medically. Uh, what does that entail? Well, you know, they stress the area of the injury, make sure it's strong and healthy. And, and they do that by, you know, putting him in some game situations, things that he would face in a game. One of them he said the other day was diving for balls, extending, reaching, and having to pop up to his feet and make a play. So uh, he's feeling good. He's feeling healthy. He's feeling strong. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to turn him loose the first two weeks of camp. I think you have to be smart and, and uh, let guys build toward the end of camp and, and as, as opening day comes into, into play. But uh, health-wise and medically, he should be ready for opening day, depending upon, you know, that he can get enough reps and get his eyeballs working, get his timing down. And that can usually happen. You can go over the minor league complex, get a whole bunch of at-bats. You can, there's a lot of ways you can do that. But looks like he's going to be ready for opening day. Um, and, you know, but it's still worth, you know, watching. You just, you just never know until you actually see him out there. Uh, but he, he's sounding confident about it. You know, Reese Hoskins was important for the Phillies last summer. There was no doubt about it. You remember that that about month-long stretch that he went on where he was bashing the ball before he got injured. It wasn't just that he was hitting. The Phillies went 16-11 and 11 in those 27 games before he went down and then just 5-12 and 12 the rest of the way. He's, very, he's a very important piece both in terms of, you know, setting the table, batting second, getting on base with that high OBP, but also hitting the ball over the fence. And, you know, Joe Girardi batted him second in every game that he played last year. Would you think that – that would slot. That would be Hoskins' slot again this year. I would. I would um, because we had a sixty-game preview of it last year. I know he was out a little bit, but you're right. He was tremendously important in that second half. We talked about it the other day uh, when he started using the whole field. He started driving in more runs. He started hitting the ball harder. Started getting those hits. Uh, he had continually got on base even from the beginning because he's a guy that's always been a. Uh, I'm not crazy about the word patient because I just think you know you get a pitch to murder uh, in your wheelhouse you better you better go at it and murder it. But I am a fan of the word selective. Uh, know you know when that pitch is there, when that pitch is not there. So he's a very selective hitter. Even when he was kind of struggling early in the season, he was still getting on base. I would think Joe would hit him second. Joe basically said on uh, Tuesday. Uh, that Bryce Harper is going to be back in that three hole. So I think kind of it lines up that way, though managers play with lineups in, in spring training is always a possibility of a change, but they, what they were in the major leagues last year, they averaged over five runs per game and they were in the top five. I I, I might have to double check that, but they're in the top five, I believe in in runs per game last year. So scoring runs wasn't a big problem and kind of like, that lineup Joe uh, often put out there. So I would think we might see Bryce, uh, I mean, sorry, Reese right back there, Bryce in three hole as well. Well, uh, people were remarking about Scott Kingery looking a little different, huh? I guess, he, you know, he bulked up last year and now he's kind of uh, slimmed back down. Anything else stick out to you as you were uh, kind of monitoring the Phillies here in the first week of full squads? Well, the Kingery thing definitely stuck out to me. I actually think you could have a uh, – a, a positive effect on him offensively because, you know, when you when you look in the mirror and you see these big uh, biceps, uh, you think, oh, I better start, you know, dropping the ball over the wall. And, and you know, when now he's a little quicker, a little leaner, um, and, you know, maybe the temptation to try to lift and, and, and hit home runs disappears and he goes back to the guy he was when he was a Pac-12 batting champ, when he was tearing up the Phillies minor league system, having a line drive, gap-to-gap approach, and that's something they would like to see. I think that's something he would like to see. 
Um, he feels like he lost a little bit of quickness um, being up around 200 pounds last year and having a little bit of uh, muscle on him. So, And I'm not saying he still not doesn't have muscle and he's not strong. It's just different. It's not as bulky, right? He's still a professional athlete. Uh, he's still a very strong kid. Uh, but uh, it should help his quickness, and that could really come in handy uh, defensively, as we know, um, because he's going to compete for that center field job. And, you know, you want to be quick out there. You want to be able to run down balls in the gaps. It's very important on this Phillies team defense um, because, you know, you look around and they're not a sharp defensive team, or at least they weren't last year. When I look at them, I only see one real above average defender, and that's the catcher. Um, Andrew McCutcheon plays left field on, uh, you know, on, on a knee that's been uh, – he's had two ACL tears. Um, so it's very important to center field get over there and, and help uh, cover some ground. And uh, if, if, the, if, if a less bulky kingery – uh, is a quicker Kingery. That's a good thing. Yeah, the Phillies don't need Scott Kingery to be a power hitter. They have enough power. They need Kingery to hit like 275 with a 340 on base percentage and, and be like a viable hitter at the bottom of the lineup. They don't need him to worry about hitting 20 home runs. That's not really like his uh, his value to this team. His value is being able to play all those positions, add a little D, add a little speed, and hopefully, you know, maintain the uh, type of offense that he showed in, 29, in 2019, rather, because you remember how impressive Kingery was for a bulk of that 2019 season at the plate. He was, you know, and I remember him hitting a lot of extra base hits, a lot of extra base hits. Uh, and I remember seeing some confidence in the swing too. So, um, you know, you'd like to see him eliminate some of the chase uh, off the plate, uh, some of the, some of the big swings. And uh, there's a, he's a talented guy. He's a talented player. I think uh, he, it sounds like he's come into camp. Uh, really refreshed, uh, ready to put 2020 in the past. I mean, he had that COVID uh, situation where last June where I remember talking to him about it. He's really knocked on his butt, uh, really kind of knocked the crap out of him. So uh, kind of a fresh start for Scott Kingery. A lot of talent there, and it's, you know, it's up to him to go out and, um, and, and use that talent to make, a, make an impact on the team. We're seeing in the NBA right now that when guys come down with COVID, it's about a month, and, and when they come back, it's still – takes time for them to get their win back and their stamina back. Scott Kingery, you know, he came back pretty quickly from that. He he had COVID last summer and still played pretty much half the season. So He did, and he, he talked about not having his full wind back. That was the thing that um, kind of linger, lingered. Um, so in so many ways, a fresh start for him. Really eager to see how he plays in spring training and beyond. Uh, very eager. It's an important year for him. It's his fourth year now in the big leagues. Uh, you know, it's time to turn it on. It's time to show that talent and, um, and make an impact. Like he, has, the- like, like he has at times in the past, you know, like you mentioned 2019 when he had all those extra base hits. I'm sorry. I was going to say, so what about the big guy, Bryce Harper? You know, he dealt with that back issue uh, last season, kind of uh, sapped him of what had been an MVP type start. I mean, Bryce Harper was just insane the first three weeks offensively in 2020 and then dipped, still finished with very good numbers. But right. do you always feel comfortable, confident that uh, that back issue is in the past for Harper, as of now at least? Sounds like they do and it sounds like he does. But uh, you have to monitor it, uh, especially a back issue. Anybody who's ever had them. And, and when, when an athlete has them, they can be – particularly uh, um, negatively Im- impactful. You know, you just don't, never know when they're going to flare up. But, you know, there are, there are maintenance programs where you can kind of, you know, um, eliminate some of the risks and, and really uh, keep your strength going so you don't have a flare-up. So, um, you know, I, I, he worked on that this uh, off season, and he'll continue to do that. He is healthy. He's strong. He's always strong. He always is in shape. I mean, the guy works out like a demon. And, um, you know, I think they'll also be a little careful with him at the outset of spring training. He doesn't need to be out there on, um, you know, February 25th getting four at-bats. He doesn't even need to be out there on March 5th getting, getting four at-bats. Sprinkle him in, you know, and, and the last week of camp, uh, last couple weeks of camp, you know, sprinkle him in early, get his eyes working, get his hands working, take your time with him, and then, you know, start ramping up the last couple weeks, get him out in the field and – uh, and he should be good to go. But you don't need to be wasting a ton of bullets in Clearwater. There's a fine line. you got to get him ready, but you don't need to be wasting a ton of bullets with a guy like that. Um, so he's really important. We said this last year. Um, we thought, like, if he finished in the top five of the MVP voting, they'd be a playoff team. Well, 
after and this was such an oddball season 2021 with 60 games i mean that's that's not a baseball season but it is what it was so the first half of that season he was like fifth or sixth in the majors in batting average and second in slugging percentage i mean he was just lighting it up roughly i'll say for a month right and then around like august 22nd uh, everything started trending downward. Well, that's when his back started hurting, uh, and it affected everything. Uh, and, and, you know, that slugging percentage, which was second in the majors over the final, like, you know, month, he wasn't even in the top 100 in, in slugging percentage in that span. So it really, really uh, took a toll on him. And, um, you know, and not coincidentally, the team suffered in the standings. So you need a healthy Bryce Harper. You need a healthy Bryce Harper for six months. Um, he is a guy who's reluctant to take days off. Uh, it's time he not be reluctant. It's time he let the manager, you know, um, be judicious with his workload. Occasional day off. You know, it's like, it's like when you trim the rose, you know, the, when you prune the rose, it stands taller, right? So if you prune the playing time, maybe the performance stands taller. So a little nip in playing time here and there can really help. Uh, and well, I think he has to be, be open to that. He doesn't have to set uh, world records uh, for, uh, for being on the field 162. He can peel back a little bit, and that might help his overall production. And there's so many elements to that, so many layers to that. You need to have good depth so you, ha you don't have a huge drop-off when you put them in there. So you have guys that come off your bench, spot starters, and, and help out. That's, that's how you built the team the right way. But um, I, I just think he's going to be fine, but you do need to keep an eye on it. Last two seasons, Bryce Harper's played 215 of 222 games. He's played 97% of the games as a Philly. He's actually played more than 97% of games the last three seasons. So, you know, I don't care how much you work out, how hard a worker you are, that adds up, especially if it's three seasons in a row. Especially the way he plays, all out, all the time. Um, you know, diving for balls, diving for base, into bases. I mean, that's one of the things that really stood out to me last year in the short season of 2020 with no fans in the stands. You could hear Bryce Harper when he split into a base or when he dove into a base, and you could hear him scraping across the uh, infield, and it actually at times sounded violent. And speaking of violent, we know he really takes a, a rip at the ball. It's a, it's, it's a violent swing, and it, he – you know, corkscrews his whole body. That that takes an impact or has an impact on everything you do. So, um, you know, he's got to watch his workload. Um, I don't know at the stage of his career if he can calm down his swing. He kind of is what he is. He's looking to grip it and rip it. But there are times when he does go up there and it looks like, you know, he's taking a less is more approach. And you know what? Sometimes less is more. He's so strong. He doesn't have to come out of his shoes. Um you know, to hit it over the fence, to hit, to hit a gapper. Um, but that's the way he plays, and that's his personality. It's all out all the time. Um, and uh, it's gotten him to a pretty good place And now uh, in the game. And, and now it's just about, you know, maintaining it. And every player has to go through it. He's only 28, but every player has to go through it as they approach 30. They, there's, there's modifications they have to make in, in their approach, in their training. And I think he is smart enough to do that and in tune enough to do that because, I mean, he's a guy who wants – he's, he's going to – you know, he's got a 13-year contract, so he's going to be like 40 when it ends. But even before he got that contract, he was a guy who wanted to play until he was 40 and was very mindful of his conditioning and, um, and, st and staying in shape. So. Um, you know, I, I just think ultimately um, Joe's going to watch his workload. Bryce has got to be watch his workload. And he still can be out there and getting, you know, 600-plus plate appearances. You just have to, um, you know, know where to pull back here and there. Well, as you know, as cool as hearing some of those natural sounds were in 2020, like players talking to each other or, as you mentioned, Bryce Harper sliding into a bag, I think we'd all agree that, We'd like to see fans back in stands. And uh, this week, Philadelphia Health Commissioner Thomas Farley said it was, quote, unquote, likely that some fans would be permitted in the stands when the Phillies opened their season at home against the Braves on April 1st. Great news, huh? I mean, that's, that's, that would be the first step toward normalcy, huh? Toward getting a somewhat fuller crowd back at CBP. Yeah, good news uh, in the, you know, um, focused on the sports world, but also I think good news – in a, in a bigger picture just for society to try to get everything rolling again here. But um, it is, you know, it's the entertainment business. Um, players, 
draw a lot of energy and adrenaline from fans. And on the business side, the organization derives all of its revenues from fans, right? From, you know, television and, and media subscriptions to uh, who goes through the turnstiles and buys concessions and, you know, interest in the team. So, you know, the fans generate all your revenues. And for the players, they, um, they uh, you know, bring a lot – they help the player build a lot of adrenaline. Um, and um, so it's really good news that it sounds very likely that there will be fans in the stands, I'm sure socially distanced. I don't know how many. I don't think it will be a huge number. But it's a step in the right direction to have some fans in the stands uh, on April 1st. And as, you know, vaccinations, you know, become, um, you know, more – uh, widespread and maybe the pandemic um, flattens out, levels out, and we learn to deal with it even more. Maybe we'll have more fans in the stands as the season goes on. And, um, you know, maybe they'll be selling it out again uh, in the playoffs in October. And there might be a sellout past the center field wall again, you know? Shout out to the pandemic crew. Even if there is a, a cap on fans in the stands, I, I would bet that that would be returning in 2021 after how much of a hit it was last summer. Yeah, they were great. You didn't pick me up on, on having them right in October. You didn't pick me up on that. I was, I was already thinking about my transition. My bad. That, that's not being a team player there. I was being self <laughs> <laughs> I still think I still think, you know, they're going to be better. I'm not ready to say they're in the play. They're going to go out and stay healthy, play well. Braves are really good. They're the team to beat. The Mets are much – I think the Mets are improved. Uh, I think the Nationals have, you know, Soto, one of the most dynamic players in the game. On paper, I still think the Phillies are probably a uh, fourth-place team, but I do think they're going to have a better year, and I think they can be playoff relevant if, if, if they play good. So, And they uh, need to not go 6-13 and 13 against the Marlins, right? You need to, yeah. You, you're right. You can't go 6 – yeah, I mean, and, and go 2-7. and seven. Remember <laughs> – Two and seven in September are down there. We just all knew, like, this big series, and they, they couldn't have laid a bigger egg. So, yeah, you got to take care of your own business. you got to go and beat people. And they got, you know, Real Mundo and Harper and Baum and Hoskins and got a good top three in the rotation. They need to go out and beat some people. Jim, there was a report uh, from John Heyman Wednesday morning that the Phillies have checked in or one of the new teams that have checked in recently on Jake Odorizzi, who's, like, the best available free agent starting pitcher – when I first saw this news, it was pretty surprising just because the Phillies are so close to the luxury tax and they've added all these starting pitchers. What do you make of that? Do you think it's just due diligence or could there be more interest? Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll call up John Heyman and, uh, and find out what he's, what he's got cooking. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, he usually comes to me for barbecue uh, advice uh, about where to get good barbecue. Uh, so maybe I'll ring him up and, under the guise of uh, talking barbecue and find out what he's hearing, but uh, uh, Odorizzi is, I mean, hey, he'd make you better, right? Uh, but I don't know if it's due diligence or is there something real there. Um, I'll tell you what, if I was running a front office and I had a, an army of assistant general managers, they would be on the phone all the time with every available free agent's agent finding out where things stood. Um, because I just don't think you ever check out on a guy. I mean, clearly they were looking for starting pitching. I'm sure they gauged uh, Odorizzi's uh, market and availability and everything else over the winter. He's still out there. And why not make a call and just see where his demands are now? Suppose he surprises you and says, well, you know, I've always loved cheesesteaks and, um, and my market hasn't developed. I would pitch for the Philadelphia Phillies for a million dollars. Well, you jump on that, right? Um, so that's why you never check out. Of, of, a, of a pursuit. You always maintain contact. You never actually say, we're out, right? Because you never know what opportunity is going to circle back and be, and be dropped in your lap. I'm not saying Odorizzi is, is, is going to happen for the Phillies. We know they're over $200 million now in payroll. They're going to be up against the tax again this year. And I really believe it would be nice to have some flexibility at the deadline. Um, I'm not saying they wouldn't go over the tax, uh, but – uh, for the right opportunity, they might. And uh, we have to remember, they signed Matt Moore and they signed Chase Anderson. Was that $7 million total? Yeah. Those are both guaranteed contracts. So um, I, I don't know how much more flexibility they have in the payroll or how much fle more flexibility they, they want, want to have in the payroll. Um, I think that's the key word there. How much, how much do you want to have? But 
You know, it, it wouldn't surprise me, and I'm sure John's right, uh, that they've maintained contact. And, and that's a smart thing to do. Just see where it goes. You never know my, what might happen. See where it goes. You never know what might, um, might drop in your lap, what might present itself. And uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you've already said no to it before it's been presented to you. So uh, he's an interesting guy. Uh, you know, the other guy out there, some relievers out there, Shane Green, another interesting guy that's still out there. Um, you know, at this stage, it might behoove those free agents to continue their workouts and wait for a team that has, you know, championship aspirations, wait for a contending team to have a breakdown. And then all of a sudden you become a little bit more in demand. So I don't know where that stands, uh, but I would, I'm sure the Phillies are monitoring it. And I think they would, they would be foolish not to monitor it. I think it's incumbent on them. And it's, it, it's, it's a responsible thing for any free, uh, any front office to continue to monitor every, every possibility that might make you better. Um, to see if it could be a fit in your budget or in your personnel and never say no to anything. So that's uh, where that stands. But I'll, I'll get John on the phone and we should have him on as a guest on our podcast one time. Should, I, mean, I, I miss my annual FaceTime from the winter meeting since there are no more physical winter meetings. So he's a very, he's a very entertaining chap. I was on a plane with him once. We were covering the Yankees in 96 and we were flying from – Detroit to Toronto on a Northwest Airlines flight. I don't even think they exist anymore. And, you know, he's a great reporter. And he had a story. And so we were both on the aisle. We were across from each other. And he had his laptop out. And he's just, you know, hacking away on the keyboard. And I'm, like, sitting there. And I'm like, oh, God, he's got something big, you know. He, and, the, and the flight attendant, you know, says, you're going to have to put that away. And, he ignores her. He's just hacking away, hacking away on the keyboard. You know, they come to him again. You're going to have to put that away, sir. You're going to have to stow that. And he just, okay, I got it. He hacks. She walks away. He continues to write. Now we're, like, rolling down the runway, and he's still writing. And I'm like, oh, what's he going to, you know, he's got something big. He won't stop writing, you know. And, um, and finally, you know, I, I think they, she came down and threatened to throw him out of the plane unless he, unless, uh, he, he put his laptop away. And uh, it was a really fast flight. So we <laughs> landed in Toronto, and he whips it open again and starts hacking again. And I forget what the story was. Oh, uh, you forget the story. Uh, I forget yeah. what the story was. Um, but he's a, he's a very entertaining guy. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Heyman was the Yankees were playing down uh, – the Yankees were playing the uh, Texas Rangers in the 96, I want to say, division series – and he wrote an article just trashing Arlington, Texas. <laughs> and he just trashed it. And, uh, and he, I, I remember there were some people very upset with him from, from Arlington, Texas. But one of my favorite guys. And that's one of my, one of my favorite – one of my famous tangents. I apologize for that. <laughs> no, that was, that was great. Um, so, yeah, John Heyman with the report about Jake Odorizzi. His last full season, Odorizzi, 2019, really good year. 15-7. and seven. Uh, ERA just over uh, ERA of 3.51 more strikeouts than innings pitched. He's not a guy who goes deep into games, though. Again, I mean, he's like a five, five and a half average uh, innings per start guy. And he's closer to that tier, I would think, with James Paxton and Taiwan Walker in terms of what he'd cost, like $10 million a year or so. There were indications recently that uh, Odorizzi is looking for $15 million a year. We've talked about the value of in-season flexibility. To me, Keep the in-season flexibility. You've added enough starting pitchers. Do you really need another candidate who's not like a supreme difference-making guy? I mean, Odorizzi's pretty good, but he'd probably slot in like fourth in the Phillies rotation. And if it's going to cost you 10 or $15 million, it's probably a little too rich. I just don't know that they're going to go there. Where's their number right now? I mean, you've done a great job keeping track. Of they're over 200, right? From a luxury tax perspective, they're at like $201 million. So they have about eight and a half to $9 million below that threshold. And does that include the possibility of Watson and, uh, and uh, Kinsler making the team? It does. It does. It does. So, um, you know, maybe there's a little flexibility. I, I don't know. But I think, it, like I said, I think it's worth keeping, keeping an eye on in case the number just tumbles 
drastically, and all of a sudden he's a fit. So that's why you, you kind of keep your, your finger on the pulse uh, of every remaining free agent. Um, it's not like back, you know, when, when I first started covering baseball, there was, there was one GM. You had a GM who did everything. Now they have, you know, they have a president of baseball ops, they have a general manager, and they have a team of assistants. Keep in touch with these guys and, and, and find out everything you can about where their market is going. And then you bring it upstairs and you, and you see if, if they can be a financial fit. So it doesn't surprise me to hear that they're monitoring. I, I don't know where it's going to go. Well, today's Wednesday and the Phillies' first Grapefruit League game is Sunday. And in between, we will have another Phillies Talk podcast. He's Jim Salisbury. I'm Corey Seidman. Thanks for listening.